but I'm really excited to introduce our guest and learn more about what Whitefield has going on. You guys have been a buzz around the industry, and so I'm really excited to talk about it and introduce you to all of our listeners. And without further ado, John, I'd love to introduce you. I'd love for you to let us know a little bit about how did you get into this industry and who were you before the hemp industry? <laughs> Thanks, Manny. Appreciate the opportunity to be on here today, but that's a great question. Probably uh Ours was definitely a, oops, how do we end up here situation out of the gate? Um, I've been in agriculture and farming and uh, risk management for 20 plus years. So actually, uh, we had recently sold a company that we did a lot of private product development for the crop insurance programs to supplement the federal program. We sold that company, so I got back into the uh, retail side of crop insurance. But about six months into that venture, we actually got called and asked to create a uh, crop insurance program for hemp in Colorado. So we just started down the path doing our due diligence. And next thing you know, you know, Illinois became legal. We said, all right, well, if we're going to insure this, we better really understand the crop from, you know, all the way down to the, the agronomic side, all the way through the supply chain. So we started to grow in Illinois while we also put together our risk management program. And fast forward four years, we are <laughs> into the cannabinoid processing. We are doing setting up our processing facility for fiber and herd in Sydney, Nebraska. And you know, it's not all, it's definitely not been the uh, Swiss road by any means, but uh, <laughs> like everybody in the industry that's been here a while, we've definitely taken some some bumps and lumps on the way, but you know, we've got a great team and a, a great support system and we've met great people in the industry. So we've fortunately been able to weather some of those storms and, and on a path to uh, hopefully really help build this industry into something what we all believe can be a large and significant opportunity for many people. I like it. So I think my favorite part about what you just said is your experience in agriculture. So many people see this crop or see this opportunity as a gold rush. And really, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've sat around people that say, I want to invest, I want to get in, but I don't have any agriculture experience. <laughs> right. And so yeah. coming from that experience makes a huge impact for your team. Right. So can you talk to me a little bit about what is your, what, who's on your team and how did you guys build this team and come together? Yeah, so it actually just started initially with my partner, John Taylor. We'd been partners in our previous company for 10 years. John different, John Taylor, different John Taylor than most people know in the industry. So kind of funny, the last industry you're in, there was another John Taylor as well. So everybody was like, which one? <laughs> <laughs> so we call him, J we call ours JT. It's easier okay. to decipher us. But yeah, John and John, I don't know how many times we've been in meetings and there's been multiple Johns. And it's <laughs> we have one joke, there used to be a group of us, three Johns and another guy and our other business partner, Bill. So we were considered three Johns and a dollar bill all the time. So. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so for us growing up in, as a, on a farm, seeing uh, all the ups and downs that can occur from crop to crop, droughts, commodity prices, we saw out of the gate, like how important risk management was, but you know, what really drives us and why we kind of focus on the farm first and the farmer first is that, you know, I don't think a lot of people really think about it, but actually everything we do starts with the farmer. And if the farmer, if it doesn't make sense for a farmer, how do you grow the rest of the industry? And that's where we start is like, let's figure out a way to make sure that the farmer has opportunity to be educated, has a way to actually make sure that he can make money in a situation and not rely on an insurance or, or a bad situation to occur. Really where it starts for us is figuring out how do we get there? So that's where JT and I started with the company started on the CBD side, you know, we saw that as the low hanging fruit to get, get into the industry because it was the only market that was established. It was, you know, that was in end of 18, first of 2019 when we did that. Unfortunately, obviously it was at the same time, everything was crashing about four months after we got in. So we have had to weather that storm, but we always knew the fiber was the long-term play. So through that, we made some great relationships. We met Jamie Campbell Petty from Midwest Hemp Council, which she was She's, yeah, I, I don't know if she's on, but she is. I hope she is. Yep. <laughs> I know she's not feeling good, so sending her good juju. Yep. So she made some great introductions for us. We started working with hemp processing partners, Shane Pritchard and his team, and, and then a couple other guys we met over that had long backgrounds in the insurance and risk management areas, as well as in capital growth. So we actually just... We knew in order to do our vision, we needed to find a group of people that had expertise in different lanes. And because no, not one of us can say we're great at anything or experts at all of it. So you know, we right. know risk management. We know how to work with farmers and how to help. You know, I guess 
talk about the farmer and help them understand how to make things simple in some some form or fashion. So we we went to Shane and, and Brian, his partner, and said, hey, this is what we want to do. We need you guys to come on board. We've, we've worked with them for two years on processing equipment and stuff. So we'd had a working relationship and uh, went to Janie and said, hey, we want to have you as a part of our team. We need some advocacy. We need somebody that's connected, that understands the industry uh, even a deeper way than what we do. And somebody that just, you know, we know that we can trust to help us and help manage all the things on the on the government side. And, and that piece that, you know, that's not our expertise. I don't like having to deal with anything more government than <laughs> the next person. And then, uh, you know, we brought on some very skilled people for our, our senior management team. And and here we are. It's 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 been a long road of of working through this for over the last year to pull everything together. But we are getting to that point. We're still working through some of our struggles and bumps now. But overall, we're we're getting we're on the right path, and we feel like there's nobody that has a stronger management team and experience in the industry from what we've been able to pull together. Nice. I want to talk a little bit about what does this mean? Farmers first. Now, how, how does a company like yours implement that? Because it's a huge risk understanding that the commodity prices are high. Why would a farmer partner with you? Why would a farmer partner with XYZ company, right? So what does yep. it mean to really finally be putting farmers first? Well, the bulk of that is you have to be honest with the farmer. You can't put out fake numbers. You can't put out numbers without understanding the entire depth of production. I think one thing we've been, that, that's been a battle for us is we've seen companies take things out that say, hey, it's, it's X to grow, but then they forget, well, well, there's irrigation costs, there's land costs, there's labor costs, there's fuel costs. And so what we show a guy on those numbers is usually two and three X to grow a crop than what we see a lot of our competitors do. But it is, it's start with the farmer, make sure he realizes this is not a gold rush. I think one thing we can really do to help mitigate a lot of the risk is we have the risk management experience and we have our own program that we can actually ensure the crop for the grower. It's exclusive through us but right now. We're not taking that out through anybody else just because uh, the first two years of having it on the market, we've definitely seen uh, some farmers that didn't want to uh, work in a manner which was kind of as a team and they wanted to go on their own. And those guys are typically really struggled. But if we work together as a team and kind of go through the education process and and bring the experienced people in, these guys have had a lot of success with this. So it's really about, it's about teaching the farmer. It starts with the education. We've got to help them, you know, got to learn about the agronomics, which that's really hard to do because there's not a lot of great studies that really say it's hundred percent this or that, like you have a corn or soybeans. So that's, that's really where it starts with us is figuring out how do we make an economic model work for the farmer and, and just be upfront and honest. And if it doesn't work, like, Get perfect example is we had a lot of commitments and guys saying, hey, we want to grow with you this year. And then Ukraine war started and commodity prices skyrocketed. But when you're selling corn at $8 and the guy says, hey, I really don't want to follow through on my contract because I have a sure thing over here. Well, I get that. Fine. Do that. Let's keep in touch and let's grow together in the future. You've got to be willing sometimes to say no and walk away because it's the best thing for your for your partner. And that's how we look at farmers is they're our partners because if they don't win, we don't win. Okay, so how, how do we bridge that gap? How are we going to grow the industry as we're being kind of stopped or stifled by these extreme commodities, commodity prices, right? Which, I mean, cotton also is twice as much as it was last year. And so, yeah, yeah I'm curious, what is what is the... What's, what's the strategy or how do we do that as an industry? Well, right now, I think we're kind of lucky as an industry because it's still supply and demand and there's really no supply. <laughs> so it, it's a little bit easier to battle that higher commodity price because we can offer a higher price. If you understand what the farmer needs, when it would come out, we offer really aggressive prices. But we also know on the backside, we have guys that you know, what they were paying 20 or 30 cents a pound for on a competing product is now they're paying 75 or a dollar cents dollar a pound because they're having to deal with shipping international type issues yeah. and just those prices went up everything's up so it's not difficult for us in the in my opinion from what we're seeing to come out and say hey yeah, we need x now we need to sell this at you know, whether it's 45 cents or 65 cents you know everything else has gone up with it for the most part too so it all kind of balances out but long term in the industry we have to be prepared to make treat be able to treat this as a commodity that Farmers can't make on a farmer can't make six hundred dollars an acre every year on corn and soybeans. 
And they can't expect they're going to do that in hemp long term either because a typical you farmer. Maybe, you mean that's their profit per acre? Yeah. The, if you did good grain marketing this year, you should be able to make you know somewhere between $400 and $600 an acre of profit. But typically, we work with a lot of farmers that if they're making $50 to $150 an acre of profit on their corn production or soybean production, that's a really good year too. And that's more of a normal year. And you get these these odd years where you have either you know commodity prices shoot up because of world events or a drought, and certain pockets really win from that, or the whole into, uh, or the farmer in a whole wins from that. Um, but on the flip side, everything goes together. So we've got to make sure that we're planning long term. That you know we have to educate, we have to give the farmer the opportunity to make a little bit more money on this front side over the next three to five years. We bring the product the crop mainstream to large production ag, but it has to be ready to be able to get farmer to that point that he's just looking at it and say, all right, hey, this year hemp prices are X. I'm able to make $150 an acre where corn's only at $75 an acre of profit. I'm growing hemp this year. We've got to, it's going to take five, 10, 15 years to get the farms to that point. But once we do, that's when we know hemp made it as a large scale crop and product long globally, in my opinion. Okay. Can you talk to me about average input costs? And what input costs are looking like for farmers? Like, so I get an understanding of what crop price would be per acre or per ton working backwards. If I'm looking at four to five hundred, you know, dollars per acre or fifty to a hundred dollars per acre in profit, what are average input costs? So they and again, this year is also really high. <laughs> yeah, like I'll give you an example. I just had a quote given to me from a, a, a farmer that we work with. He said a year ago he was able to buy Roundup at nine dollars a gallon, and it was pushing thirty-five to forty-five dollars a gallon a day for Roundup. I don't, I've not seen that myself, but I've, I've heard of that from a couple of guys. But traditionally, like if you're a Midwest farmer and you have two hundred to two hundred and twenty-five bushel corn, your inputs were probably somewhere in the uh, mid seven twenty-five to eight hundred dollars an acre range. Right now, you're pushing a thousand dollars plus everything, and it's going to be worse next year. Farmers contract a lot of their inputs ahead, usually almost eight months ahead of time, sometimes more. So they can, they've got inputs locked in at a lower price right now for this year. But when we come around to this fall, you're going to be talking about input prices that are, you know, north of a thousand dollars an acre in a lot of areas. And then and some of that varies on what their land costs are. But, you know, land, I see land rents skyrocketing in areas that I've never seen that go above 250. And now you're talking $400 and more just to rent ground. So it's, it's, it's just going to be tough. And part on hemp is that, you know, we still have a lot of the same inputs, but there's a lot of areas where I think when we look at it pre-harvest, we can probably help a guy grower in the place to probably be somewhere in that, you know, depending on the land cost, six fifty to $800 an acre pre-harvest to get to, to get to harvest. And that's kind of what we look at when we look at risk management. What's it take you to get to harvest? Because your harvest costs are so variable based off of how large or small your crop really is. So there's there's a lot of variable factors that tie into this. That's what I want to learn about. <laughs> I would love to dive in this sometime more, maybe even just one on one, because I'm sure there's a lot of farmers. But yeah, I think that especially as people are trying to figure out, you know, and compete and bridge that gap, understanding those variables. One thing that I also learned in putting our seed trials together is working with farmers to communicate with farmers is very impactful. Yeah. Right. Because this, these, this exactly is making sure that, you know, when we're looking at, say, somebody on the processing side or manufacturing or distribution side, understanding those input costs and the variables and the challenges that then input or impact our in products. Right. All of this, the, the supply chain. And so going back to what you said in the beginning, making sure that you understand every piece of the supply chain, you know, from farm. Can you talk to me about what are some of the end markets that you guys are really you know, anticipating to open up over the next couple of years that you guys as you know, you guys will really be prospecting or looking forward to? So yeah, the, the end markets, I think it's kind of a, I think it's really hard to tell what they're all they're gonna be. I think it's an endless opportunity right now. Right now, the 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 easy ones, I would nothing's easy, but the ones that I see popping out quickly are I see a lot of a lot of need in the animal bedding space. I see a lot of interest uh, from paper companies. We're seeing a lot of interest in uh, the hempcrete and insulation markets as well. And that's just, uh, those are just some of the, the top easy ones. Natural fibers going into, you know, 
body panels or things like that. That's obviously talked about. I think the plastics market will be interesting to see what happens. I think the biggest issue we struggle with is for some of these bigger markets to come on board long term is HEMP has to get to that point where it's not so much a unique commodity, but more of a mainstream commodity where we don't have to pay the farmer you know, as much as we have to right now to get them to come on board. Because right now, some of our price points are going to be tough for companies to want to shift to. Because I think long term, you've got you definitely have a huge market in, in in the construction space. You've got plywood, you've got MDF boards, you've got hempcrete, insulation, and and who knows what else, probably things I'm not even thinking of. But we've talked to cat companies that want to build hemp-based cabinets, hemp-based plywoods. You've already got hemp wood and hemp architecture who are doing some pretty unique and cool things on their side with the hemp wood. And uh, we've actually seen samples from another company on composite style fencing and boards or like we compete with on a Trex. I think there's a lot of op- unique opportunities in some of those higher end markets out of the gate. I've seen um, some really cool finish, like the laminate finish made out of yeah. hemp, you know, and it doesn't look like hemp. It looks, I mean, it's like what we put on cabinets, right? And so, yes. yeah, it's pretty cool. Yep. So those are, I think, I think the auto industry and the RV industry will be huge, but yeah, we're excited about it. It's, it's interesting. We we actually hear a lot of international stuff coming across our plates too. And there's a lot of smaller countries that are trying to figure out how do they get into hemp and and start getting into processing so they can expand and you know improve their own situation versus being so dependent on importing from everybody. So it's 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 just going to be a uh, large evolving opportunity. Yeah, and that's what makes me the most excited. Again, is this you know, evolving opportunity. I actually have an opportunity here coming coming up to put some speakers together for a presentation in Utah. When we very first started talking about the event, it was a lot around the CBD and, you know, high THC, low THC markets, recreational medical. And I said, well, what about all of these other topics? And I sent in basically like a laundry list of things that I think <laughs> hemp touches on. And so we've been able to put some really robust panels together and I'm excited about you know, the education side and Again, it was like that laundry list of things that hemp really plays an impact. When we talk about bridging the gap, you know, and really moving the, the the opportunity along and the need for large investment, right? And for someone to put that their their foot forward and say, hey, we're going to do this so that everybody else can then be more successful, right? Can you talk to me a little bit about some of the challenges and some of the things that you guys have been able to overcome as a company in the process of developing your company and putting processing together, securing farm contracts, so forth? Yeah, honestly, I think this is an area that is one of the biggest struggles for all of us in the industry right now. You know, the the government's not fully giving us uh, support, which is holding the banking industry back, um, which then makes the capital providers nervous. But then you also, what's the struggles, you know, there was a lot of money thrown into that the CBD and the cannabinoid space. And I probably, you probably couldn't name 10 groups that actually made money at the end of the day through that. So the capital markets are really sore from that side. It's, it's been a big struggle for us. We've talked to a lot of groups. Um, we're, we're going through a, a capital raise currently today. You know, the biggest thing they want to know is that we're obviously as an industry, we're in the chicken and the egg. We know what we see, what the demand is. There's so much coming at us time but until we actually have enough to uh do something with it and enough capital to support it we can't start talking about even getting into these large-scale contracts until we have that type of capital backer with us i think that's the big thing that we just need to continue to get these small wins in the short term whether it's small contracts you know it's a big thing just getting the farmers to want to come on board right now um we're, we've had a lot of success with that with guys wanting to work with us whether it was right timing or not for this year with commodity prices is a different story but the interest from the farm side is huge to want to get into the into growing right now with a good opportunity so i, I think we've just got to figure out how to continue to educate the capital markets the debt markets and work together and i think the you know, the more companies that come together and keep pushing down the same path and, and showing what's going to happen, well, it'll break through. I know we're pretty close. We've, we've been negotiating things with a, with a group now that they, they really love what the industry is doing. They love the management team. They love where everything's going. It's just a matter of, you know, they want to be comfortable that, hey, are those buyers really there? I'm yeah. um, actually, I'll give a shout out to Jose. He and I were literally talking about 45 minutes before the call today. And uh, it was pretty interesting just kind of sharing each other's opinions and and views of what's happening in the space. So it's, uh, this is something that we've definitely got to break through on and it's not easy. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there was a comment made earlier that where we must be talking with farmers and listening to them. And, you know, this goes back to the beginning of our conversation. I 100 percent agree. I think that, you know, we don't have an industry. And it's kind of funny when I look at it from you know, a business or investment perspective. It's interesting to me how many people say, OK, yes, I'm ready to jump in. And it's like, well, wait. I, I get that we're ready to build this big facility, but we don't have the input. We don't have the farm. We've got to structure this part of it. And it really, yeah, it kind of, again, it's the cart before the horse. Sometimes, yeah. Right. And yeah. I think that's an area that sets us a little bit different is I, I feel, I really feel for the, some of these companies that have come into this where they're almost just a pure startup and just trying to do the processing or get started that way. It's really hard for them. We're a little bit different. We're, you know, we're merging five companies together, three of which were already established, making money profitable. We have, we had a number of assets available. So raising capital has been difficult for us at times, but yet we're still in a better spot than so many others because we, we, we were able to pull, you know, existing businesses together. Uh, which revenue. Gives, gives you a lot of revenue. You weren't yeah. in this angel phase, right? Yeah. I don't know how an angel group complete startup would, would get funded unless they just had their own cash with deep pockets. It'd be, I, I'm like you go into a tech space or in a lot of a lot of other industries where you can just they'll just write a check quickly. <laughs> Here it's it's totally not that way in the hemp space. <laughs> oh yeah, I actually was giving a presentation the other day with the Salt Lake Chamber, and there was a fintech company and a couple of big banks. You know, and every, all the banks were like, "Oh yeah, we're not touching this. We don't even mess with it. There's no way we want to do this." And then there was another company that was fintech. You know, and he was like, "Uh." Yeah, I don't even think this is something we could participate in and I uh, don't know what to ask. And so it, it's interesting as it opens up. The thing is, is I think it is opening up more and more banks are coming on. And not only are we coming on to, to bank hemp, but they're banking cannabis. Right. Yeah. And so that becomes just more and more open. You know, and it's funny to me, more banks that start to learn of other banks that are generating an incredible amount of revenue and are able to grow, you know, then it really piques interest. You know, yeah. when I look at this as, you know, approaching it from, you know, when we talk about bridging that gap, really approaching this from a rural economic development opportunity, right? Yes. Yeah, grants, different opportunities like that. Like, those are going to be key things to help drive the industry. There's so much we've got to learn. You know, we, talk, we were talking a little bit beforehand. Well, number one, we got to learn a lot about the plant, but, you know, we, we know there's a great opportunity in the ESG space and the carbon credit space here. But... The carbon credits are, you've, it's all got to be proven. So number one, there's a lot of education that has to be done both on what's going to be able to be proven, what can't be proven, who's going to be able to use that credit, how do you justify that credit? You know, like, there's all sorts of areas that we've got to go down and, and go through. And we're working on a lot of that. We entered into the uh, X Prize competition. You know, we how decided that to do that. Application? Pardon? How was that application? <laughs> Worse well, than a grant application? <laughs> I would have to say yes. Drew and Bill on our team led it, and I'm sure Drew would say this was absolutely brutal because, you know, we did probably uh, months and months of work in about 30 days. So our guys were great. They went to work and did everything that met the requirements. It was interesting to see when I watched the X-Price stuff roll out that, you know, there was, I think there was, did I read a stat that six or eight hemp companies made it through to the final group of 287 or 67? I can't remember. We were one of those. But then when I yeah, but then when the final 60 were announced, I don't think there was a hemp company in that group. I went through and looked at all of them and it kind of surprised me. Like you've got an industry that so many people see so much opportunity in the sequestration, but yet they didn't move anything, even one company. I, I don't even care if it was ours. I'd love for it to have been ours, but getting one hemp company through would have been a huge, huge movement for the industry. So it's interesting that they didn't see that. I also think like there's a lot of, data that the hemp industry still needs, right? Somebody yes. asked me earlier what what I thought was a big pain point in the industry and data, right? And not, not even so much like data just for the farm, but data on those end products, right? The proof that putting yeah. X amount of, you know, hemp or biochar or whatever it is made from hemp into a product sequesters X number of tons and that that piece of data and life cycle analysis, I don't, I don't know that we have a whole, whole bunch of them. There are some, I'm not saying there's not, but again, where and how do you access it? Right. And back to kind and of. So in, 
it's so inconsistent right now. If you if you go out right. and look at the different research papers, you'll find one that says it only does two tons an acre. You'll find others that say it does 25 tons an acre. It's like, yeah. we need to get to a universal spot and some true data. I agree 100%. We're, that's something we're, we're, we're going to continue building that. I really think that the carbon credit market is an area that we've got to, one, develop for the farmer. You know, whether it's hemp or the other crops, it's not being utilized enough because it's not understood or simple enough quite yet to be able to go large. Sorry, I just lost my train of thought to go uh, streamline across the, the large yeah. industry. But then the same thing on the flip side where you're going to is, you know, what are we really able to sequester, whether it's into a construction product or into a final, you know, auto industry or whatever it is like, what's, what's that? How do we validate that? And well, we know how to validate it, but it's going to take years to do it. Right. Right. Now you made me lose my train of thought. I was focused on your train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> so scale. What Can you talk to me a little bit about your processing? What are you guys expect, uh, anticipating as far as scale? Oh, I know what I was going to say. I interviewed somebody the other day that quoted 36 tons of carbon per acre. Oh, wow. I've not heard that one. That's Hey, if we can get that, that'd be great. I'm um, just curious what that looks like, right? But a lot of it was under underground in the soil. Hmm. So, yeah, that, that's a, you know those are numbers when we talk about two tons to thirty six tons like that that's a huge difference and I've also heard you know ten tons and yeah it's a, a big span so I'm just validating basically what you're saying is there's a big span. well well I'm taking that further then we've got to figure out once we validate what happens in the soil and what happens just in the plant like then we've actually got to create a model where the farmer wins on that credit and the end user the retail product producer is actually in a spot that they can utilize that and as well. It's got to be a system that wins for both sides of the equation. A lot of times it seems like it always wins one way or the other. And we've got to figure out how do we help both sides be able to utilize that that opportunity for that carbon sequestration, that carbon credit. Yeah, absolutely. So scale, when we look at yeah. scale of operation, you know, and, and I'd be interested too in your opinion on the demand, like the potential to meet the demand with scale? Well, uh, scale is definitely going to be an issue for a lot of us. I think we're in a little bit, I feel like we're in a little bit better position because we have our main system on one line can do pretty significant throughput. We can handle somewhere between 10 and 14,000 pounds an hour on one line, uh, which that scales out to be you know, somewhere between 12 and 18,000 acres a year, depending on you know how many shifts and what the yield is per acre that we're processing on. So, it, but after that, you know, you've got to add multiple lines. And if you really want to get this into a large scale situation, you're talking about like, give you an example. We were looking at a contract the other day. We're kind of playing around with, all right, what's it take in the plywood space? But if you wanted to produce enough plywood just to say, hey, I'm going to stick, you know, three pallets of plywood in, a, in half of the Menards in the country, three pallets a month, you're talking about needing, you know, 90, 60 to 100,000 plus acres of hemp just to meet that one type of opportunity. Then you talk about, we looked at an insulation one that they want, you know, I think they, they want 250 tons a day of vast fiber. Our one line can barely produce 125 tons a month. <laughs> so we obviously have a huge disconnect on what the, what, what we can supply because the demand is definitely higher than what the supply is for sure. So that, that comes back, that also drives back to the, the capital side that, you know, we've got to have some significant capital providers available because if we can, we get the product in but we're gonna have to scale as an industry like there's not i look at this industry growing similar to what how ethanol grew ethanol came out it was one plant then two and next thing you know we had uh i think we had north of 300 plants operating at one point and i'm guessing it's now probably under 200 in the country but i view hemp's probably going to grow in that similar manner that we're going to have to have a lot of facilities across the country so there there should be lots of white fields there should be lots of you know xyz other companies like this has got to be something that we all are working together and pulling in the same direction to some extent. Well, and to understanding, to that, understanding still, right? Like you said, they've got to stay close to that farm. They've got yep. to be at a certain, you know, distance from farm to make it competitive for the farm for the first piece. Right. Yeah. I'm also interested in feedback first before I go any further, because I've been meaning to give a huge thanks to our sponsors um, on our seed trials. We got an awesome group of sponsors to come through. And so I want to real quick give shout out to Prairie Ag, Alco, 
course my phone rings. Um, IND Hemp, AgriLead, South Bend Formation Ag, Let's Talk Hemp, and West Town Bank. When I was talking about banks, I've got to give a big shit, shout out to them because they've been incredible for us and incredible for so many of our members. And so shout out to them since we were going back to banks. But now I don't remember what question, what were we talking about before I give shout outs? See, uh, so good, John, you're, it's wearing off on me here. <laughs> I know. I, I got about, I got the attention span of a gnat sometimes. So <laughs> <laughs> yes. We're, we we're talking about scaling. Yeah. Scaling. Oh, so how far, right? And co-op model. I wanted to kind of know, you know, when we look at scale and locations, um, when we look at big, large scale, you know, processing like yours compared to some of these all smaller ones that are going in and then even larger scale that may potentially come into the industry, right? Or that are yeah. going to start coming into the industry. Where do we look at, you know, what does, what does model opportunity look like look for these rural smaller communities you may have a lot of farmland but obviously a smaller community how do we build that you know what's your feedback and it doesn't necessarily have to be your model but i'm yeah. curious because as i speak to you know even countries like africa that aren't going to have the scale that the us will or equipment yeah i'm kind of curious from you as to model yeah, that is, I think we're fortunate in the U.S. that we can, I think we have the ability to scale a lot quicker, especially in the rural areas. Because I think a key thing where I think where we put a lot of emphasis on is that I don't want this to come off the wrong way at all. You know, we love everybody in the hemp industry, but I don't feel like we need to do anything more. A lot of the shows in the hemp industry, I want our company to focus on how do we build out relationships in the other ag industries and in the other side first. Like, we all we already know all each other on the hemp side and we can call each other every day but we've got to figure out how to have that same connection whether it's with the retailers the grain elevators like some of these established areas where they already have great networks they have great relationships with the farmers we need to tap into that we need to find ways to partner and and get those into those smaller communities i think uh, like I'll, i'm happy to share what our model is on how we're planning to we, we right now want to have every farm inside of 600 miles of radius. Then we envision that getting down to 300 miles. And eventually I think you've got to have farmers inside 100 to 150 miles of the high side. You know, shipping costs probably aren't going to get much cheaper in the future. They got to come down a little, but it's crazy. We've got a logistics is a big issue for all of us. And I think we've got to be strategic about where we place facilities, not just for the current network, but who is buying the material. If you're, if you're shipping a ton of material into Michigan for whatever reason, why would I want to just keep doing that from Illinois or from Nebraska? It's like we've got to get get tap into the markets where everything is going to be at. And going international, you know, part of what we're trying to do as a company is we envision we, we want to actually help set up facilities in other countries. We don't want to necessarily be white field there. We just want to be able to, with Shane's team and their expertise in engineering and the ability to scale, like we would love to be able to sell equipment internationally, whether it's in the you know, Mexico or, you know, Asia or Africa, wherever it is, Europe, you know, and then the key is, is, but you can't just sell equipment when you go into a place like that. You've got to help them understand how do you build the agriculture and how do you build a scalable system that can actually feed that system? You know, if you just drop the equipment in there, you know, if you're not teaching the, the farmer the, what to do, nothing's going to work. I mean, that's the key of it. When we talk to partners too, or like we want to talk to them about, how are you going to scale this and how are you going to build it and how are you going to feed that? We don't want the last thing we want as a company is to all of a sudden be setting up these facilities and all of a sudden in two years, because we didn't plan to help get the farmer going, all of a sudden be, oh, we look at all the uh, white field equipment for sale because that facility didn't make it. It's It's got to be. And I think every group should approach it from that standpoint if they're trying to scale out similar to us, which I think most of the companies want to scale like us to some extent. And I'm sure they have their own plan. But, you know. I think that's where it all starts is how do we how do we make sure we can feed it and support it each plant by itself and not rely on external factors, especially if we're going international. You can't you can't put a plant there and then say, hey, I need to import all my hemp from the US. That just drives the cost too high and they're back to the same position they're in now with their other commodities. Right. Right. It's interesting how much demand there is for US fiber though. Yes. You know what I mean? I mean it's just yeah, it, that's been kind of something that I was really disconnected from. And you and I kind of talked about this in the beginning of the interview of like understanding where my clothes came from, understanding who, if, if I had to kill my own meat, I would probably starve. 
because the process of which it takes, right, that I've been disconnected from because the convenience of going to the store and buying something. And hemp has really exposed that part for me. And yeah, again. Yeah. And I think it's, I think for the industry, getting started right now is perfect because everything is so expensive to import, like, yeah. and, and nobody can get it. Like, I was talking to a group last week in Indiana. Um, they're, they do just trying to get sheets of plastic. They are on li- limited on what they can get because the, the, the I, he worded it as magic dust. So I'll call it the magic dust that goes into that, that sheet. It's on short supply. So it's like the more they can, and that company is a US based company trying to get the other stuff in. It's like, we've got to figure out solutions to support everything domestically as much as we can. Um, it's our opportunity. Yeah. This is our opportunity. We were talking earlier about government support, right? I'm really hoping, you know, we just kind of talked about how the X Prize, we had hemp companies making it through to the first round. I'm really hoping we're seeing hemp companies get grant money through this climate smart commodity grant yes. and grant money open up for this infrastructure build, right? So that we can, so that we can get support to organizations like yours or other pro- large processing facilities and secure inputs for farmers, right? So that we give our farmers an opportunity to say, hey, I'm, if it's not insurance or if it's not subsidies, right? A way for them to know that if they're going to grow this crop through the R&D phase in the few, first few years, they at least have a secured imp- or few, a secured revenue off of it. And yeah, it's very challenging when it's on the shoulders of private money and we don't get any public public partnership. And so I'm really excited to start to see, I'm really hoping that we see hemp organizations get some of that money. Yeah, I think we will too. I know like for the work that you do and the work that Jamie does, like it sounds like everything's moving in the right direction. You know, we've got good things happening with the, the next farm bill to hopefully make it easier for the for the fiber and the grain side of it. Um, so we're not treated and lumped together like you would on a cannabinoid basis or a marijuana basis. So I think there's definitely a lot of traction in the right way. I, I, we've talked to a few people um, in the Congress and, and Senate that are supportive of it. And then I was actually... Uh, we're actually participating on a grant with U.S. Freedom Farms, um, and they've got a lot of support. They're, U.S. Freedom Farms is a pretty unique company, too. These guys, uh, they do a lot for veterans. They try to help get veterans involved in farming, try to help create new jobs for uh, for veterans. So we, we were really bought into that right out of the gate. One of my co-founder was a veteran in the Navy, from the Navy. So it's anything we can do to support that side of it and uh, to do some fun, th- unique things like that to help just, you know, overall good for the world, you know. We've got to we've got to figure out how to do that as well. <laughs> and that's what's really exciting too, right? Is again, this goes back to we're not just the product we're talking about. Or by securing farming and processing, the opportunities we open up on that back end for there's countless. That that's what I'm most excited about is to get finished product or processed product raw materials into the hands of these kids because I think they're gonna <laughs> they're gonna rock our worlds with it. Yeah. Well, then the universities will start building out programs around it. It'll everything's a, a butterfly effect. Once we get it rolling, it'll be really, really fun to watch everything finally roll downhill versus what we're all doing is pushing that boulder up the hill right now to get there. I it's it's exciting. I mean, and people say all the time, "Hey, how's the hemp industry grow, going?" I've worked hard and <laughs> very little profit so far, but I'll tell you the reward that's coming and that we get to be a part of. I've learned to really enjoy this journey, not even learned it. I have enjoyed the journey because of companies like yours and the innovation that's coming to the table and the people that are doing it for the good of the people and the country and the planet, not just money. Yeah. And, and the thing is, is money is right alongside of it, right? It's that's where we get to be sustainable and profitable in the same opportunity. And so it's pretty exciting. What what else do you get a chance to build an entire industry from the ground up? Obviously, tech tech went through that in the late ni- in the nineties and early two thousands, and it's still doing it. But like we're doing something that's it can change everything. It's uh so sort of like I don't want to I hate to reference anything as a gold rush, but it's kind of what it looks like. Is that you know you have all this opportunity. There's nothing sitting there. It just takes a lot of work. And I think what's really good about the hemp industry is it definitely had to take some lumps over the last few years to make sure that we get more of a business-minded and corporate structure to help build out that infrastructure versus so much of what everybody deemed as the wild, wild west for a while, which, you know, that's never sustainable. 
so I'm excited about it. I, we've met so many great companies and people that are helping drive this that the, the amount of opportunity in front of every company, like there could be uh, 15 other groups trying to do what we're doing and there's plenty of room for absolutely every one of us. And, and it's, we are all going to take a different approach. And I like kind of back to what we talked about on scalability, like we have one way of processing it. Other guys have another way. Uh, and there'll be all sorts of new tech that comes out over the next five and 10 years that probably will really help us scale even quicker to come to be able to meet that large industrial need that we really need to get to for the industry. Awesome. 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 I want to real quick give a shout out also to our corporate members. I know a few of you have been logged in and listening. So I want to make sure that you know how much I appreciate you guys for everything that you do. Shout out to Element 6 Dynamics, Hemp Blockchain, and Environmental Living Industries. You guys are also killing it and doing great things in the industry. John, what do you anticipate industry looking like five and 10 years from now? Where, where do you see the numbers of acre? You know, we really scale. I anticipate major scale over the next few years. What yeah. Do you expect? Yeah. Where do you anticipate? I think it'll go on a fairly rapid growth pattern. As a company, we anticipate in five years to be hopefully contracting somewhere between 700,000 and a million acres ourselves just for our own facilities. I think. I think the true thing is probably in about 10 years, hopefully we're sitting in that seven to 10 million acres in the country. Um, that's just the country. I think as we go, the, the rest of the world will follow to some extent. And we'll see quite a bit of change on the global scale too. That's, I think that's where it's got to go. I think long-term, I think it could end up being, my goal is for hemp to become one of the four main crops that's in Midwest ag rotation. And that's kind of how we talk to the farmer about it is we want it to be a part of a rotation. I don't want hundred percent of your acres. I want 10%. I want a small piece because it's, we got to build it in. And there's a lot we need to learn. We need to learn what, how does rotation really help or affect different crops? We got to figure out the agronomic advantage or disadvantage. There's a lot we need to learn in the next five to 10 years to help do and that. which like, crops it's best with or followed exactly. by before, right? And I think that yes. those are the, those are the things when we talk about seed trials and building a foundation of our nationwide seed trials is to do those things right, is take this data and build it across multiple scales and multiple regions. So we have comparable data and it, yeah, so same thing. Um, it's awesome. And I, I agree, it's along with carbon, right? Fiber production yes. and carbon sequestration. Yep. Yeah, no, there's there's so many crops in so many areas that the carbon sequestration is gonna happen in, you know, but we've got to figure it out for each spot possible area and then figure out how do we make that turn into a business model that works for the entire group. Yeah. Especially start with the farmer because that's, I look at it right now, I've, we see a lot of carbon sequestration opportunities out there, companies coming around trying to get you to sign up for X. But when I do the simple math, the farmer doesn't win in that. The farmer is the one getting taken advantage of. And we're trying to, we want to be in the different spot of that. We want to make sure the farmer's winning. Um, well, that's what's scary. And, and really, that's how you're going to secure your inputs. Yes. Well, and that's something I said for a long time. Our farmers have to be confident in that supply chain and confident in knowing what who their partners are, who are they working with. You know, you become their their confidant, right? Along, what are they doing wrong? What do they need? What what's that end product your buyer needs, right? If you need seed to change, I really anticipate also just like with corn and and soybean, we're going to see certain genetics are really going to be developed or grown in certain regions or areas for certain end products, say a biocomposite compared to a paper or a textile grade fiber, Um, you know, like clothing or high end. I don't know how to separate. When I say textile, I know that's a big, broad spectrum, but I'm interested, like, how do you classify if I'm talking about like a clothing grade textile compared to a non-woven mat like (laughs) coarse fiber textile so i want to be clear that when i say that i mean like a higher end finer high quality fiber yeah i think that's not an area that i'm an expert in by any means or know much about but i definitely think that's going to be a part that takes the longest to develop because it's one thing to just get the bass fiber off but now we got to figure out how do we really process it and clean it from there and not damage it. And we've got some ways we've got ideas on how to do it, but you know, we haven't even tested them yet. So you know, we're looking forward to continued R&D on that side. And which and, genetics, uh, right? Which yeah. I'm also curious too and excited to see as the industry develops, what regions, you know, like genetics will change based on region, processing will change based on end products, which match up to manufacturing, like you said, to pair those up. And then, yeah, those end goods that 
It, it's exciting because you look at all the IP. I mean, this should excite everybody that's not a farmer, that the IP that's going to start coming out of this industry and the innovation is mind boggling. Say 20,000 or however many thousand products they say will be made from this or by product. Yeah. <laughs> right now, let's just figure out five to 10. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's what I said. We've let's got a handful there. of them. You know, there was something I heard interesting the other day that I think is unique that we won't have the same battle, but I don't remember who I was talking to, but they were talking about when soybeans first came out in agriculture. He was actually, it was his grandfather lived down by Decatur, Illinois, and the Staley's came out and they were trying to really push and get everybody to grow soybeans when it first came out. And people were like, why would I want soybeans? What do you need it for? And it was a real struggle for those guys. They had a real hard time getting soybeans the first couple of years on any type of scale. And obviously we see where it's at today. It's it's, it's <laughs> mainstream crop. But uh, what's unique is when we go out and talk to it is I don't feel like we had that problem because I feel like over the last 10 years that we've had a great education of what hemp can do, what it can provide. You know, we also have the advantage that when you look back, it, it had so much production in the during World War II and such. Actually, a little tidbit that I learned from my grandfather about two years ago when we first got into it, and I didn't realize we were one of the largest hemp growers in the state of Illinois. Back during World War II, there was a facility not too far from here that made all of the uh, strings for parachutes. And he was supplying a bulk of the hemp that they needed for that. So that was kind of, I'm see, here we go, rat squirrel. I'm just kind of going down a rabbit hole all of a sudden. <laughs> no, you're good. You're, yeah, you're great. I was but, actually uh, just reading a comment, but yeah, please keep going. Yeah, and also it's just interesting. I don't think we'll have the same struggle to get it across to the farmers yeah. because of the education that's already happened. But we got to keep building on that education to make it even easier moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. In order bridging gap, right? What do you think really needs to happen on the education side? And then I want to kind of talk about what standards you're seeing being called for by the industry or being by the you know demand of the market. Yeah, I think the standards that I see the most on right now are coming in the construction side. And I think I think that's obviously only going to increase. You know, we're we're involved with some groups that are trying to create farming standards, standards on different specs. Um, I'm really excited about that because the sooner we have kind of the, some standards like that, you'll start seeing larger scale contracts come across. I don't know how much I can share about that, so I'm not going to say too much. Yeah. Out of, but uh, you know, what about like specs? Are you getting one of the one of the demands and something we went after with our seed trials is really looking at what the demand of the industry was calling for as far as coarse fiber and herd volume, right? What are you seeing as far as you know? Are you looking at more like micronized herd? Are you looking at like smaller herd size or shiv size? Are you looking at long fiber, small coarse fiber? What are you thinking? Or well, I think I'll ask for. I think on the fiber side, it's a lot more short fiber right now. Okay. That's, at least that's what's coming in our way. Yeah. Um, that, but that's also all we're talking about because we don't know how to, we know we have long fiber available. We were able to get and produce 10 and 14 inch long fibers, but not to the ability and having it to the cleanliness it needs to be yet to go into some of those you know, premium markets like we were talking about. Right. And the, on the herd space, it's kind of all across the board. I think the micronized side will be huge, you know, there's a lot of opportunity. I love the absorbent side that we can possibly look at and the reclamation side we can look at with hemp and herd and you know, the animal bedding market's huge right now. And, you know, now you've got small, large animal bedding. So you got different size needs from there. So there's a lot of unique spaces and it's just figuring out what's going to work for each area. And that's kind of where we're starting at is like, let's just start with these three or four simple markets and see where it grows and where it goes. And I think the, getting into the equine space and the animal space is a, is a real, e I don't want to say easy, nothing's easy, but it's the low hanging fruit on the space that I think all of us are kind of looking down that path right now. Yeah. It's well, and it's interesting too, because I was also talking like those byproducts that come off. Right. And if herd is driving the market and really herd is probably a lower, less profitable pro I don't know. I don't know how to say this. Right. But if you're, main byproduct is herd and you've got fiber, but right now there's not a market. Once that market develops, that changes the game for costs and, and, and margins on both herd and fiber, from my understanding. Yeah. And so it'll be exciting to see as the innovation comes on the you know, secondary processing or in applications for those, those different fiber applications or those, you know, because like you said, the, the market is so big for animal bedding and hempcrete and, shivs and herd right now well it's something we haven't even talked about we really have to build the grain market too 
Canada's obviously done a good job of that. They've been doing it a lot longer than we have. But, you know, it's, we, we've got some relationships with some ethanol companies that are like, hey, you, know, you start talking about 200,000 acres of, of, of hemp, and then we'll start talking about buying, buying the grain from you. You know, it's, there's opportunities like that that are sitting there. And I think in order for us long term to make this a commodity that can compete with everything, we have to figure out how to use all those, the, the fiber, the herd and the grain. That's the only way we can get this thing to a price point that as processors, we can sell enough of it to make sure there's a margin that we can live with and, and still be profitable and that the farmer can still survive and, and have a, 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 a fair and reasonable income on that side, too. So it's just, uh, you know, we, we've talked a lot about that piece, but and I don't know, I have not dug into the grain a lot, but. You know, I've heard a lot of interesting ideas that we can go down the grain and it's just going to take a couple of years of a lot of R&D. And that goes back to the grants. We need the grants so we can actually get in and really dig into some of these unique R&D opportunities to try to replace and other place other uh, commodities or other products. I had a really good interview with some of the guys up at Manitoba at Harvest and some of the other large processing companies in Canada. You know, they were really talking about where their pro- where their profits are coming from on their crops and grain is definitely their main crop, right? And then fiber and herd are their byproducts of their crop. And yep. so I'm excited to see, just like you said, that grain market's got to open up and I'm shout out to Hemp Feed Coalition and some of the work that Jamie and Morgan and everybody is doing there as well, because that's a, that's a, a whole new, you know, a whole new avenue that then provides for a market, not just human consumption. Well, the grain infrastructure should be a little bit easier to build. We just need to start partnering with the elevators and the retailers are in the space because we we know a lot of them across the Midwest want to get into anything that's new and that they think is really going to stick. And I know a lot of them do believe in hemp. So we just need to start finding those right partners to build that out in a small, small path. Yeah. Do you think that I was going to ask you about grain elevators? Now I forgot what I was going to say. Something about scale of the, oh, do you think there will be certain states or regions that are really focused on grain production compared to fiber production? Or do you think that they will always be like linked side by side? I think as a whole, we probably need to figure out how to get to a dual crop where it's doing, you know, the grain and the fiber and the herd at the same time. You know, a lot of the stuff that we're going to buy, what we couldn't contract here domestically to grow in the U.S. or couldn't find that's already in storage, we'll be pulling a lot of grain stock, grain-based variety stocks out of Canada to process. So it's uh, from my standpoint, until there's enough data and we're really trying to get to a certain tinsel strength or something unique on the fiber, I kind of look at the herd as the herd and uh, we can do whatever we need with it. So I think yeah. it'll be interesting to see how that develops. There's not a good, I don't, I'm just shooting from the hip and guessing right now. <laughs> but uh, Yeah. Well, I'm curious too, just because, you know, there's that zone in the U S that's great for hemp. And then there's that zone that's, you know, historically known for no hemp. And so yep. I'm kind of curious if in those zones, it would be better grain production because of the light number of hours of light in the day. And so that's why I was asking is more of that. I, think, I would agree. You're probably right on that. I also think we'll, you know, in five years, I think we'll have a lot of breakthroughs on genetics. You know, we're so far behind what corn and soybeans can do. So it's, uh, you know, but we have so much new tech, so much more technology at our fingertips. We should be able to progress the seed in the hemp space a lot faster than the other crops were able to go. Heck, you see that just the, the breakthroughs on corn and soybeans in the last 10 years of it's just been consistent increased yields. Who would have thought 20 years ago, you'd be talking about 80 and 100 bushel soybeans in spots and 300 bushel corn on, on certain fields. It's amazing. Yeah, I didn't see. And again, this is something that in corn or even in agriculture that I, I just don't know what used to be and what was average, like I probably should. And so I, I'm loving learning more. I could continue this conversation for a long time, but I'd love to continue to stay in touch and however we can support you. How do people that are listening get in touch with you, John, or your team? Yeah, so yeah, we're, on, we're on LinkedIn. I think we have Instagram. This is, I'm terrible on this stuff. I'm not a social media guy myself. So we're, our website's whitefieldglobal.com. So, you know, there's an easy contact us on multiple spots on our site there. And LinkedIn is monitored real heavily by, by Jamie and the rest, a couple of us watch it. Those are the easiest ways to reach out to us. So then you know, through the network, I think we all know each other. So. Okay. I found your, I uh, went to go copy your URL for your website. I'm going to share it for everybody else. Are there any companies you want to give a shout out to? I know we talked a lot about what Jamie and Morgan and they're doing, even with the hemp exemption, 
which I did share the link for also. I encourage you guys to go out and support that. But yeah, do you have any shout outs for anybody that's doing things right in the industry? Oh, well, I love what uh, I love what Pan Exchange is trying to do on the carbon side. I love working with New West. Uh, they've been great as a to, to on genetic side. I think International Hemp has some great things going on. You know, I I don't know the guys at IND, but I got to give them a lot of credit because I, I love seeing the pictures on on LinkedIn of, of material going out. So the more material that we have going out the front door, no matter who it is, it's a win. So uh, you know, I just. I give a shout out to everybody that's trying out here working and every single day trying to do it right. And, uh, you know, I know we'll all have our own different plans, but at the end of the day, we're all going in the same direction. So it's, it's great to see. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, if there is anything that we can do either John or I to support you guys in business, please don't hesitate to reach out. I did share Jamie's contact info. I saw that she's on. I'm assuming that that's her. I'm hoping maybe it's somebody else's from your team, but hello, <laughs> Jamie, if it is you, it's good to see you. And Alex, it's good to see you on also. But yeah, if you guys need anything, don't hesitate to holler at me. And so you guys, please don't hesitate to reach out. These guys are fabulous. I'm a huge fan of your team and what you guys have going on. I know there's lots of collaboration happening in the industry, and I really give kudos to the people you guys have on your team for that. So thank you so much for all you're doing, John. And everybody else, if, again, if there's any questions, don't hesitate to yell at us, and we'll be out. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mandy. Absolutely. Thanks later. Right. Thank you, John. Talk later. <laughs>